Thank you. Yes, yeah. I'm going to just quickly go through me. <laughs> Did I come out right? I say this all the time. I was, still am, and will always be hungry. That's why I'm a chef, right? So when I was two and three years old, I would be in the kitchen watching Ye and Nane or Aha cooking or watch my parents cooking, and I figured if I'm in the kitchen, they're going to throw me some scraps, and they did. And fast forward, and everyone here that knows this, in China, when you see someone on the street or Taiwan, same thing. It's not the same thing, but you know what I mean. <laughs> we look the same. You don't say, how are you on the street? You don't say, ni hao. You say, chulaman. Have you eaten? Because that's awesome. Because if you see your friend, that gives you an opportunity to eat. So that was instilled into me very young. So I'm in Dayton, Ohio. I'm 10 years old. I'm home by myself. Mom and dad are out wherever. We had a great kitchen. A couple shows up at our door. And anyone that was older than us was always uncle and auntie. Didn't matter if they're Chinese, black, white. Didn't matter. Everyone's uncle and auntie. So I recognize this couple. They were driving through town. I welcomed them in the home. I said, are you hungry? They're like, oh, we're starved. I'm like, oh, sit down. I'll make you fried rice. That's also, that was fine and dandy. I've seen fried rice made 150 times, but I never made it myself. I'm 10. But every good Chinese household has leftover rice. Of course, we had ji dan. We have eggs. We have scallions, garlic, ginger. I'm good with, I was good with a cleaver. I used to sharpen cleavers with yaya. I love to sharpen cleavers. So I busted it out, and honestly, the fried rice was good. It was about a 5 or 6 out of 10 in quality, in my opinion. A little too much oil, because I didn't want it to stick, so I kind of chickened out. A little heavy on the soy sauce. I tried it, I'm like, oh, and I, to myself at 10, I'm like, oh, it's a little oil or a little soy. I watched my two friends. They smiled. They're like, this is, I think they were amazed that I could make fried rice, for one. But two, they said, this is really good. So that was my first epiphany, that you can make people happy through food. How cool is that, right? Now, no shocker, my mom's Chinese and my dad is Chinese. That makes me Chinese. <laughs> All right, you following me? I can slow it down if you want. So being 100% Chinese, and, and they already said it in the last, in the last lecture, you, you had three choices. You were going to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. End of discussion. Um, so I'm like, OK, I'll try that. So I went, I went to high school. I started studying mechanical engineering at college because I really wanted to, to be like dad. My dad is still one of the foremost designers of graphite materials in the world. We were in Dayton, Ohio, because he was chief scientist at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So he was designing the B-1 bomber at the time. So he's literally a rocket scientist. So he fit the stereotype. Um, but he was, he, was a, he was, by the way, for the record, my dad is the best iron chef cook. He can open the fridge, boom, chow mein. 10 minutes. My mom is a much better cook. She follows it to the T, you know, whatever. It, it could be Hong Shao Jozo, whatever. But everything's ex made exactly. So my mom's the better cook. The only time I ever saw my parents fight was in the kitchen. <laughs> right? They'd be like, oh, no, you shan't jia shan, biao jia shan, mi, oh, no, jia shan, no, no, I'm like, and I used to say, guys, let me do it. They're like, oh, OK. And then they sit down. After about five or six times, this is after I became a chef, I see them in their living room giggling, drinking. Oh, it's great. I'm like, you guys just wanted me to cook, didn't you? <laughs> it was. So, so I, 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 uh, I go full bore studying mechanical engineering at Yale because I want to be like dad. But then I started going to Paris every summer. My, one of my dad's partners, Thierry Massard, um, who lived in Paris, I had an opportunity to go to Paris. And I went there. And damn, the French can cook too, right? So I immediately thought, well, well I'm going to do East-West. I'm going to do called it Chinese cuisine, French-Chinese. And so they saw me. They saw that I loved working on my mom. She had a Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin Kitchen. Let me show you first. Um, this is me young here. What is this, made in China? Come on. <laughs> oh, is this on? I can make all the Chinese jokes I want, guys. I'm Chinese, all right? I just can't make Jewish jokes. This must be made in, oh, there we go, OK. So there's me in Taiwan. I was about nine years old there. Uh, that was actually just in Taichung. Um, <laughs> this is the other reason I'm a chef. My parents took me traveling at a young age, 
And yes, that is red wine. Because uh, <laughs> I was a happy kid. <laughs> All right, what happened there? All right, so this is my mom. We used to, and statute of limitations is eight years as far as I recall, we used to cater. My mom, my dad, my brother, and I do private catering events all over Dayton, Ohio. We would get paid cash. We could charge like 20 bucks a head. We'd do 500 people, just the four of us. And that was our egg roll setup. We'd be just frying eggs. There's our Ford O'Connelline van. Um, and we kept that cash and never reported it. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this is me at the Manor Kitchen. I had my own egg roll cart. That's right, Chick Magnet. I mean, that was, <laughs> look at the prices, 50 cents for an apple juice and a Coke. But I, that, was my, that was my summertime gig. I would, I would, it was actually quite funny. We would always start with 100 egg rolls and all these things, and I, you know, the dollar an egg roll, and I'd come back with 80 bucks, and I'm like, you sold out. 80 bucks? Well, Lynn and Tammy showed up with a new friend, Sheila, and that's, uh, I would give away at least 20% of my food. So <laughs> my mom's like, well, this may not work out. But then I went to France, right? So my first real, my real, job outside of cooking Chinese was in France. And as you can imagine, the, the whole, this whole doctor or engineer, I came back working in France. I had to sit mom and dad down. I said, look, guys, thank you for spending whatever it was, $100,000 at Andover. Thank you for spending another one, that same amount at Yale. I'm going, to get my I'm going to get my degree in engineering, but I want to cook. I want to be a chef. So if you've seen my mom on my show, who's the most ebullient, gregarious, friendly person in the world, who still bosses me around when I'm in the kitchen. I mean, she's 80 and she's and more peace. She's still better than me. She gave me a huge hug and said, son, you're so lucky. At your young age, you already know your passion. Oh my God, you're so lucky. Just promise you give 110%, go. We wholly support you, which is really cool because they were born in Beijing. And keep in mind, we talked about when the Chinese, when we first got here, we built railroads and then we did some gold stuff. And then we ended up in California, and one of the only métiers that the Chinese men, mostly all men, right, the only thing they could do, because they couldn't speak English, was cook. So I just went to all these great schools, and I, I want to cook, so it just didn't work out. But my parents were cool. I looked at my dad. I said, Dad, what do you think? He goes, son, you are going to be a very good engineer anyway. Go cook. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. True story. But you know what? He's right. I wouldn't fly in a plane I designed. No. But, but I'd eat my food on the plane. So I'll tell the quick story at Yale, which sealed the deal why I was not going to be an engineer. I was in a dynamics final, right? We're all old enough, some of us, that an RPM, a 33 RPM phonograph going around a circle. There's a stick, two centimeters from the center, going around the circle. On the stick is another circle going the opposite direction, going around the circle this way, and on that stupid little disc, there's a dot. What's the angular acceleration of that dot? Six people in the class. Four Asians, one Russian, a token American, you know. <laughs> Everyone that had pen protector, right, calculator belt, total nine yards. I'm looking around, it was a three question final. Like I knew I got the first two okay. Look, my motto is D was for diploma, all right? <laughs> So at that moment, I'm going around, and I wrote, it was a little bit cocky, but I did it. The third question, I wrote, I don't care. <laughs> and I handed it in. So that sealed the deal that I was not going to be an engineer. And guess what? I still don't freaking care what it is. And it's still going around in a circle. <laughs> Crazy. So we, I got to France. I got to cook. I got to what I create. No one creates a cuisine. Everyone creates a style of food, right? So I call it East-West cuisine. Some people call it fusion. Uh, it's really combining the best from Western and the East together, techniques and ingredients. Um, fortunately, I came back here and, and through a couple of different jobs, eventually opened up Blue Ginger with my wife, Polly. It's now 18 years old. We're in Wellesley, Mass. Um, it's been doing great. Uh, again, I said earlier, I'm so lucky because I, I get to follow my passion. I got to do what I love to do. And that's, that's really the, if you take anything away from me, besides I'm a smart ass, is, <laughs> is you have to follow your passion. Your parents, especially everyone here that's Chinese parents, have an idea what they would love you to be. You'll never be good at it if you don't love it. So figure it out. Now, I was lucky. I was 17, 18. I figured it out. You may not know till you're 30, 
Uh, but don't get pigeonholed into, okay, I have to be a doctor, pre-med, pre buy pre whatever, because you don't. Um, it's important you follow your passion. The, you know, we went, we went forward. I was lucky. I got discovered on TV. The Food Network, while I was working in Santa Fe, had a show called Dining Around. Um, they basically, it was a talent search show. So that's how they found Emerald and Bobby and Mario. So when I started on Food Network with East Meets West, we were, uh, you know, honestly on TV, there was Martin Yen, who's a great friend, who's my father's age. And then I came up, um, luckily, um, behind him, so to speak. And, um, and it, was, it has been the best ride ever because uh, Food Network, uh, like everything the four ladies are talking about with Teddy, um, I am the exec producer, I am the director, and I definitely star in Simply Ming, my show, right? So if you wanna, you wanna control who's on TV, do your own show, because you can't get kicked off your own show. Um, so, so my favorite show, of course, is having mom and dad on. There's no one better, uh, and mom always completely bosses me around. Um, my career ended up coming full circle a little bit because I have a mechanical engineering degree. I love competing, and I love doing Next Iron Chef and Iron Chef. I love that I crushed Bobby Flay in Battle Duck. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, but hang on. Think about this. Chinese, Caucasian, Battle Duck. <laughs> if I lost Battle Duck, I would have been ostracized from every Chinese restaurant in the freaking country. My kids be like, why are we going to Mexican? Shut up, we're going to Mexican food, let's go. <laughs> Wait, there's no dim sum, let's go. I couldn't go to any more Chinese restaurants. I had to, I had, to, I had every Chinese person in the world the weight on my shoulders. You lose Battle Duck, dude, you're a loser. <laughs> so, uh, thank God I didn't lose. So, I finally, five years ago, joined HSN, Home Shopping Network. One of the funnest, coolest things I've ever done, because I actually now, have come full circle. I've got to use my engineering degree and design stuff. So this is uh, an electronic pressure cooker. So I took everything that I didn't pay attention to thermodynamics, which I really should have paid more attention because PV does equal NRT for sure, and, and now get to actually design stuff. Um, just in case you have your schedule out, uh, April 29th, my today's special on HSN. I'm selling the first rice cooker that has a fan in it so you can cook rice in 20 minutes. So it's faster. So we're gonna sell 140 here. <laughs> hey, hey, I got two boys. They go to college, yes? <laughs> Chen. If you wanna just throw your credit cards this way, I got a little, I got the square thing. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. C100, it's cash 100. <laughs> All right, the most important uh, for especially, uh, I love that the next gen is here. The most important thing, oh, one, thank you. The most important thing um, in any job, and this is just my one quick tip, there's two things. One is details matter. Details matter. I don't care if it's a P&L because you're an accountant. I don't care if you have a scalpel in your hand and you're cutting someone open. I don't care if you're doing a recipe and you're trying to bake a souffle. Details matter. It matters that there's a little stain on that chair on the side. It matters that the, the tablecloth is right. Details matter, period. So pay attention to details. And the other one my grandfather instilled into me and dad is Chinese saying, Haren Haba. Haren Haba, right? Good things happen to good people. It's true. It is so true. And, and Dr. Myangelo always said it be kind. If you can be kind at all times, all these buzzwords, racism, and all the other horrible buzzwords that's going around this political landscape. They can go away if everyone actually thought about the other person first. Be kind to everyone. It doesn't matter the skin color or your age or your gender. Just be kind, and this place would be so much better. And I also think if everyone did eat better, I mean, think about this. I'm a suicide bomber. I have a vest on. I'm going to go. This is me and my friend. But there's Beijing Kaya Peking Duck for dinner. I'm not pulling no cord. I'm going to dinner. Think about that. Food matters. One thing I'm very proud of, and everyone in this room is proud of, is I'm so proud to be Chinese American. 
and I'm so proud that I'm Chinese. So, by the way, I'm not American Chinese. So I'm three minutes in, so I have another 22. I don't have three minutes left. No way, I can't speak that. Okay, so I'm going to play. I have two videos for you to play. Can you play? Oh, there's. So there's my girlfriend. Okay, no. <laughs> Did you meet our three daughters on stage late earlier? <laughs> Uh, you put, this is something I'm very proud of. Check this out, guys. Henry Louis Gates, Finding We've been able to take Ming Tsai back to China with his paternal grandparents who fled the communist revolution. To go back further in time, we turn to a very rare document. When Ming's grandfather left China, there was one object he took with him, a book tracing the family's genealogy back to the year 891 AD. It's a treasure in the Tsai family. But unfortunately for Ming, the book is simply oral history set down by his ancestors. There's been no way to know if it's true until now. We sent researchers to China to try to confirm the Tsai genealogy. It was a long shot. The communists had ordered that all genealogical records be destroyed in an effort to break down family structures. This was, in fact, a fundamental part of the Cultural Revolution. But in some cases, stone-carved tablets, known as steles, have survived. Before communism, the Chinese landscape was dotted with hundreds of thousands of these steles. In Ming's hometown, only one remained standing. Our researcher kept asking around, and someone told her that of all of the family shrines that had existed before the Cultural Revolution, there was only one that remained standing. Can you imagine that? I mean, of all these thousands. That's crazy. Just one. Could you please turn the page? Can you read the transcribed name taken from the steely? Tsai Ying. You know who Tsai Ying is? That's, that's the same last name. Tsai Ying is your 36th great-grandfather. You're kidding me. The one shrine that survived is your family shrine. Come on. That's it, baby. I just got goosebumps. Wow. That's crazy. That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. The Steely confirmed Ming's family history to the letter. It documented his ancestry back to 891 AD and beyond. That is your family steely that miraculously survived. And what the odds mean? I'm just, I'm so proud. That's amazing. So, um, so hats off to William Gates. Uh, the, I encourage you to see this because, um, from that steely, the researcher went to the Shanghai Rare Books Library, where there was under glass the same book that we had, which went to 890 AD, but it was bigger, red, and thicker. That book ended in 890 AD and started in 2700 BC. So the first Tsai, my great-great-grandfather, 100 generations, was Huang Di, one of the original emperors. So please bow. <laughs> Security, they're not bound. Like, oh. <laughs> My son, Henry, when I told him, we showed, the family tree goes from me to that screen. It's 100 names. And by the way, Tsai Lun was the 36th who invented paper. If he just got that freaking patent, <laughs> a, pa a penny for every piece of paper, I, I would be C100 by myself. Um, <laughs> but when I told Henry, Henry was 11 at the time, and he's, his eyes lit up when we showed him the family tree that we came from royalty. He's like, Dad, what does that mean? <laughs> I know what he was thinking. And I looked at him and I says, it means recycling and garbage is Tuesdays. <laughs> you brush your teeth and floss every day. Nothing. He thinks a chariot of gold is coming up our driveway. <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, I'm going to close with one other quick video, if I may, because I know my time is up. But this is the most important thing, I think. And being Chinese-American, I think, I so agree with what Teddy was trying to get across in the last speech. We have to speak up. We have to make a difference, and we have to leave our mark. So the way I've left my mark 
Uh, I work with a fantastic charity, and I wish everyone would look at this. It's called Family Reach. Go to familyreach.org. We help families who have a child with cancer. And I've created this event called Cooking Live, and I've been with them five years as the president of their national advisory board. I have personally raised $4 million through this event that I've done. Uh, so if we could roll this tape, I want you guys to see. And I want you guys to come to the Cooking Live. There's one coming up in Boston and one in November in New York City. So check this out. This is the funnest event for an amazing cause. Tonight was a really big night for Family Reach Foundation. Our ambassador, Ming Tsai, created the concept of this event, Cooking Live, where he brought in his celebrity chef friends to cook live in the round so people could not only taste these celebrity chefs' food, but they could actually see them preparing it live in person. My brother told me about it actually, and we've been going through uh, my father's cancer treatment for the last couple years, and it just seemed like a really good one for us to come to together. I've seen Family Reach grow over the years. Just seeing that they're growing, they're helping more families um, each and every year is just a, it's so important, and it puts a smile on all of our faces, and that's why we're here. Our goal is twofold. One, get people to learn what Family Reach is all about. So that's the primary goal. The secondary goal, which is not as important, and even though I'm a chef, is everyone should have a fantastic meal and a fantastic time. I'm so proud to be a member of C100. Uh, we are leaving our mark as C100. There is so much work to be done. Um, you know, be proud to be Chinese. And, and if you do have kids, I've said, I've said this for 40 years, teach your kids Chinese. Ah, yeah, seriously, teach them Chinese. <laughs> you have to be able to order Chinese and Chinese in a Chinese restaurant. It's the most important thing. You don't have to politically debate. No, but you got to be able to chow tsai in a Chinese restaurant. If you don't know Xiaolong Bao and Tunyo Bing and Guo you're done. <laughs> all right? Thank you all very much.